You're watching. You're watching. You're watching. You're watching West Hartford. West Hartford Community Television. Community Television. Community Television. For the community. 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 By the community. By the community. By the community. By the community. For the community. By the community. And it's a wrap. Hello and welcome to As I See It, A Blind Woman's View. Thank you for tuning in this evening. I'm your host, Andrea Judici, and I have with me my guide dog, who, as always, I'm not introducing because for his focus and our safety as a team. I'm so excited. I, I swear I start every show that way. I'm so excited because I've been wanting to do a series for a very long time. Pretty much as soon as I got the show, I wanted to do it, and now it's finally happening. The series that we're starting tonight is called Pup and person to partners. And it's going to have a bunch of different episodes talking about the different phases that have to happen for a puppy and a person to come together to be a guide and a handler. So each of the episodes will have, will focus on a different aspect of getting prepared, either the puppy getting prepared, growing up, training and becoming a guide dog, or the person learning their skills, going to class and all those things that happen to get a guide dog and to become a team. And I'm really delighted tonight because I have with me one of my absolute favorite people in the whole world who is a puppy raiser, has been a raiser for many, many years. And what a puppy raiser means is that these dogs, this dog that you see here at my feet could never do the job he does if he grew up in a kennel. He would have no concept of the world, of what a dishwasher sounds like or what stairs were. And so the puppies, when they're very, very young, eight to 10 weeks old, go to live with a family, an individual, a couple who volunteer their time, probably quite a few couches and shoes, and uh, to the process of raising that puppy from, a, from an infant to an adult dog that's a, a really awesome citizen and knows how to be really um, well-behaved and in many um, environments. And most every guide dog program has this, in fact, I think every guide dog program has the fact that they have puppy raisers. So I'm, I'm talking and we, we need to hear from Karen. So Karen is here tonight with two of the dogs that she's raised. And it's so interesting to me, Karen, because you have with you a dog that's about to go back in. So you've had her for any num a n number of months. You'll tell me about that. And she's about to go back to, to, to go to sort of go to college, to become a guide dog. And you have a puppy who's what, 10 weeks old? Yes. Who you've just gotten, who's just starting on this journey. Mm -hmm. And so um, tell me a little bit about you and, and, and what numbers puppies these are for you and how this all happened for you. Um, my husband and I, back when we bought our first house, had decided that we might want to get a dog. And he mistakenly told me that and and I don't give up on things easily so I thought if I get a dog and I don't like dogs then um, you know I'm gonna have this animal for 14 years and we may live in separate rooms or something and so I found out about a program where we could raise a puppy for a year and um, I thought it was a good way to test the waters and I knew that we'd have to give it back for a, a bigger purpose afterwards and so we became addicted and that was and, how many years uh, ago? It was 30 years ago. <laughs> and um, Ian, sitting on my lap, is my 22nd guide dog puppy in training. And uh, Yana would be the 21st. And um, she'll be on her way to guide dog school in another two and a half weeks. Wow. So when, these, when, when Ian, let's use him as an example, comes to you, what does he know about being, um, living in a house, being part of a human animal pack, and potentially going everywhere with someone in public? Um, when he first comes to us, he doesn't know any of that. He knows his litter mates and the kennel, and he's probably been out onto gra the grass um, in the good weather. Um, so he's literally taken from his litter mates and um, the comfort of where he's been born and grown, grown up till that point. 
comes to our house and we have to teach him everything he needs to know about daily life in a household with people. So um, he's already, oh, he's been with us about two and a half weeks now, he's already learning to go up the stairs. I put him down halfway up the stairs and let him finish on his own. And um, he's learning to sit. <laughs> We're learning leash walking. We're also learning to go to the bathroom on command, which a lot of people don't realize is an important thing for a guide dog to know because a lot of people work or have places to go and they're busy all day and um, the dog can't just freely the bad word. be able to go when it needs to go, exactly. So, um, so yeah, we teach them to go to the bathroom on command. He's already got that pretty well down. As soon as I say the words, he goes. So awesome. yeah, he's really, he's really making great progress. So tell me some of the things that you will do with him over the course of his time with you and how long will he be with you? Um, he'll be with us probably about a year. Sometimes it's a little longer, sometimes a little less. Jan has been with us over a year just because of when she was born and when they pull the puppies in for training. Um, he probably will go back in around this time next year for his formal training. So it's our responsibility to teach him basic commands, probably 10 or 12 of them, um, to make him um, a dog that's, you know, a nice house dog that is comfortable to live with, that's not getting on the furniture, and um, it doesn't sleep on the bed because it's up to his person down the road to decide whether or not he should do that. Um, and then we socialize them. We take them into all kinds of environments where they learn about different noises and different textures on the floor and smelling flowers and meeting other animals and children and people with different outfits on and costumes and things. So the point of puppy raising is to get them used to as many different um, situations as they can so that when they go into the actual training with a harness, they're used to all of the environmental things and now they can just focus on the, the harness work. It's awesome. I can't I can't find all the words. There are not enough words in the dictionary to try to say, and I've, to any puppy raiser I meet, thank you, because I've had, I'm with my sixth guide dog, and they've all been amazing, and all of them have had different type, you know, different lifestyles in their raising homes, but the, the commonality is that they, what these puppy raisers do is just unbelievable. What you guys do is unbelievable. And, and the foundation you build for who this dog is, um, Yes, there's a lot of other things involved. There are trainers and breeding, but without puppy raisers, there isn't a guide dog walking the street that could do the job they're doing and not anywhere anywhere close to be able to do it as well. So that is so awesome. So tell me a little bit about some of the places that you bring, so, some of the places or many of the places you might bring a puppy in training, a puppy that you're raising. Um, Ian has already been to uh, the nursing home and the um, coffee shop where I generally hang out in the mornings. Um, there's a whole following of people who are now used to the dogs and can't wait to see what's happening next and to greet them in the mornings. And it's interesting, I actually wrote an article on how these dogs kind of provide therapy for people before they even become guide dogs because people will come in for coffee and be looking like they're just having a bad day or someone who's not an animal lover or whatever and then you see them on their way out just bend over and pat the puppy and big smile comes up and then off they go so um but he will be going to um the mall um out for dinner to different restaurants um we go we do a lot of outdoor events in the summertime car shows and fairs and things like that to spread the word about you know how uh how our school, our particular school um, works and um, to just get the word out there that if people are in need of a guide dog, um, they can contact us or, or any one of the other schools. We're always looking for puppy raisers and that sort of thing. So, um, you know, anything that we can think of. I, Yana's leaving in two and a half weeks for training and I really want to get her to a movie theater before she leaves. I haven't ever done that before and it oh, just go popped go into my you. head and I thought, that's something I really want to try before um, before she goes. Yep. But um, my husband works for a town, and he goes to a lot of public hearings and things. And so she's been to to those kinds of events, and some um, you know things that you don't think of that might affect them suddenly will, like clapping or um, 
you know, people in costumes or different kinds of uniforms and things like that. So, you know, every experience is a good one. And even for Ian, if I don't take him in places right now, um, I have him in the car with the windows down and he can hear road noises and other animals and kids playing and things like that. It's all part of the process. Yes. It's, it's interesting. I, I've, I've had the opportunity to talk to a lot of people who are, who are raisers and, oh. and some of the things that I've taken for granted, like for example, I know that I can touch my dog's feet, I can touch his ears, I, can, I, I do and have to touch his entire body to make sure that he's healthy and he doesn't have any ticks or bumps. But I didn't realize that most dogs, most people's dog, pet dogs, do not like having their feet touched at all. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that he learned in training, that's something he learned from his razor. Mm -hmm. You guys probably spend a lot of time playing with your puppy's feet and mm -hmm. touching their bodies because they're gonna be living with people who don't see them. Yep, cleaning their ears, um, even if they don't necessarily need it, um, looking in their mouths, checking their teeth all the time. Um, this little guy, I've already had to take his temperature a couple <laughs> of times, so, but all of those things, just constantly touching their body. And, you know, it's interesting because if you do it a lot, they actually enjoy it and you can see them relax. You know, if they've been out and been busy and come home and they're stressed and you just, you know, start to rub them, they just relax and it kind of takes the day away. So just like we enjoy massage, they, right. they do too. Yeah, but, absolutely. Um, hey. So you have raised a lot of puppies. Tell me some stories if, if they jump out. And something that's interesting that I forgot to mention is that Karen raised the first Dog, the, my brother's first guide dog was raised by Karen. Um, and my brother's most recent guide dog that retired, Karen helped us to find his retirement home. So you've got a lot of connections to, <laughs> to us, more than just being a really cool person, um, which is awesome. But I'm sure you've got some pretty funny stories or some interesting stories of people's reactions or your puppy's reactions or things like that. Um, <clears throat> the first thing that pops into my head is when um, the Meriden Square was being remodeled. Um, they took out all the elevators and escalators for a while and um, so to get up and down from one floor to another we had to use stairs and we would uh, go to the mall a few nights a week um, to exercise the dog and get them used to things and so we started using this wooden staircase and on a Friday night all of the kids on the stairs would clear the stairs out like they thought we had a sniffer dog <laughs> and uh, it always makes us laugh when we're walking along and people will look and go, oh, it's a blind dog. And then we'll look back at them and say, the dog isn't blind, or <laughs> we'll make eye contact with the person and they'll realize that we can see and it's not really a guide dog. And um, it's just, people's reactions are just very funny. Of course, when you know you have a little one like this, everybody <laughs> just comes running for pets and, and such. But um, we did have a dog oh, that wow. um, when we first got it, oh. we took it um, shopping to buy a car because we wanted a car that the dog would fit in comfortably yep, yep, and yep. Um, and she was the best dog the whole time that we had her she sat on the floor in the front seat whenever we went anywhere we'd leave her there to run errands and stuff the the last week that we had the car we were, had already gotten the, a price on trading it in and for some reason she was left sitting in that car for about five minutes and ate the front of the front seat <laughs> and we had to have the seat reupholstered so we could get she didn't want you to get rid of her car she <laughs> so said this we, is my car so we could get what they quoted us as a trade and we had to actually have the car repaired before we could turn it in a few days later so <laughs> oh my gosh that's so funny <laughs> Um, I just had a, a question just came. There goes my train. Again, my thought. It's a, there's a train that runs through the studio. No one can see it. And it steals my thoughts and oh. takes them far away. It's terrible. Um, so, so I know that sometimes after you've raised these puppies and you put all this work into it, something can cause them not to become a guide dog, mm -hmm. whether it's um, you know, fear of surfaces or car sickness or something else. And sometimes they don't go on to a different career. So, so have you ever... Um, become reacquainted with your dogs either as a career change dog because they didn't go into training or after they've been a guide dog but they've been retired um, has that happened in your world i have never had one of my dogs come back to me in retirement um, they've always either found a home with their person or with a per the person's family member or something like that so we've never had a retiree come home which is probably a good thing because we'd have like, you know, uh, 20 dogs in our house. Um, but um, I do have two career change dogs at home. Um, one of them went out as a working guide and was only out for a few months and he was terrified of little children. 
Um, apparently, a few came up behind him while he was guiding and tapped him in the behind. Yep. And so he started paying more attention behind him than in front of him. Yep. And uh, so I did some pet therapy with him for a while and kind of got him over that. Um, my other one, by the time she was a year old, was showing dog fear. And um, she did actually go in for training, but only got halfway through because she was so terrified just being in the kennel with all the other oh, dogs. That's right. that, that must have been awful oh, for her. the barking and right. where, where are those dogs and are they coming to get me? And so when she came home, she was really, really fearful and she'd lost a lot of weight. And to this day, she's eight years old. They still can't walk her in the neighborhood oh. because she's terrified of the other dogs that live there. And she's always scoping out, you know, outside the fence to see if there's other dogs out there. And um, so... Um, those are a couple of the reasons that dogs can be released. Um, I know um, a couple of the siblings of labs that we've had have had medical releases for elbow dysplasia yep. um, or something like that. They have allergies that are too much for a per the, their person to take care of, those sorts of things. It's so interesting to me because I'll often hear people say that the dogs, that they want to get a dog that flunked or, and I, or <laughs> failed, and I don't like either of those words because <laughs> There seems to be this Im this impression that um, you know if a guide dog doesn't if a, if a if a dog being raised and trained to be a guide dog doesn't make it as a guide dog then there must be something you know horrifyingly wrong with them, and the reality is that it can be something simple like car sickness, um, fear of loud noises which wouldn't affect them as a pet, fear of of open back stairs. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in most dogs' lives, they don't ever have to really walk up open back stairs. So if they're afraid of them, that's not a big deal. For a guide dog, that's a big deal because often enough, I have to ask my dog to guide me up a flight of stairs that doesn't have any backs on the, you know, any backs on the stairs. He can't refuse to do that. He can't say, sorry, I, I don't like this particular part of my job. Right now, yeah. So get someone else to help. I'm going home. <laughs> um, and it's just so interesting to me because I... Um, People seem to forget that they're dogs. They're not machines. Mm -hmm. and, um, but because of the work that you do and, and all, all puppy raisers do, because you expose them to people in hats and garbage trucks and stores and food and buffets and movie theaters and, and bands and parades and all the things that they go to, this dog here can go to all those things with me. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a huge, huge gift and, and cuts down on the time the trainer needs to spend with them teaching them the nuts and bolts of their of their work of the of actually wearing a harness and guiding someone well, um, that allows them to put the harness on the dog and teach them all the specifics just of guide dog work because they already know all the other things and or most of the other things and um, they can spend you know their attention right in a small and yep. in a smaller amount of time get them through exactly. um, the actual training part yep. And there's some interesting things that I know, again, from, from having lots of friends who are puppy raisers. There are, there are a lot of different rules for a puppy raiser, as far as I've been told, than you would, might have for a pet. You mentioned some of them, not being able to get on the bed mm -hmm. or the furniture. Um, you, I, I know um, that I had a, a, a puppy that was raised and taught to play laser tag, which was very Ooh. detrimental to him as an ad adult guide. Um, they, so there are rules that you have that wouldn't be the same as if you just went and got a puppy and decided to have a, a pet. And um, I know people that can be hard from leash li relieving your dog all mm -hmm. the time. Can mm -hmm. be. Um, so um, that, but that's so important because a dog that plays keep, a guide dog that plays keep away, a guide dog that can't um, relieve on a leash that has to be out running loose in a yard to, to go potty, a guide dog that feels it's okay to get onto any piece of furniture might walk into on a boardroom and go, oh, look, it's a chair. I sit in chairs. Or on a table. <laughs> or on a table. <laughs> Even worse. <laughs> yep. Um, a dog that's allowed to, 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 to scrounge around on the floor at, at, in its puppy raising home for food might just do that in public in a restaurant as a grown-up adult guide, which is completely inappropriate. But I've heard people mm. say that they don't really understand why there are so many rules. And yet when you think about the fact that the dog's going to live with someone who most likely doesn't have a lot of usable or any usable vision, needs the dog to be able to um, be in all kinds of places with all kinds of distractions and sounds and noises, and needs to, to not interact with them visually. Mm -hmm. and, and so even, those are all the, you're, you're laying the groundwork for all of that. I was just gonna say, and even to know in the house, like what's theirs and what's not theirs, yes. because 
for a person to have a dog and not be able to see what the dog is doing, you have to be fairly mm. confident that the dog is not mm. stealing your sandwich or chewing yep. your shoe or yep. um, t doing potty in the corner or, you know, all of those kind of things. And so that's kind of what we keep track of so that when they're, by the time they're ready to go on to their training, they already know that, you know, what the ground rules of living in a house are and um, what's fair game and what's not and what they can do in the house and what they can't. and. Uh, and then you know carry that on forward to their next home. So when a guide dog is working it wears a harness. When a puppy in training is working out and about and learning its trade, uh, I know that, that, that it, and I think probably both of these dogs have on their uniform. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a coat and it's, it mimics the harness in a way. It's the same sort of same mm -hmm. going around the body. And um, when you get that out, Ian, probably not yet, but certainly for Yana, does she really recognize that as being going to work? Oh time? yeah, definitely. Yes, definitely. She, um, this sweet, quiet little girl who's laying here by my feet is by no means that kind of a personality. And so- Oh, look, um, it's his sister from another <laughs> mother. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she's especially quiet because she has her gentle leader on tonight because when she's with other dogs, she likes to visit. And so I was trying to prevent that tonight, but. Um, in general, even without the gentle leader, when she has her coat on, she knows it's work time and she's very focused and um, she does everything that I ask of her at this point, um, which she should be doing because there's not much time left. <laughs> um, but when she's home and that jacket comes off, the first thing she does is run about five huge circles around the backyard. So I think that the jacket um, tells her it's work time and um, she is very focused and because she holds her personality in while she's working, she needs to release it when she gets home. So, um, yeah, she's like, too pro she has a bipolar disorder or something. Yes. <laughs> I, you know, it's interesting because he is, he is totally like that and, and there are people who know him only in his work personality <laughs> and then they'll encounter him somehow. Like maybe it's, you know, the end of the day at work and I've taken him out of harness so that he can relieve some of that, you know, that energy and they, they just can't believe it's the same dog. And, and it's interesting because people know that they are a different, often a slightly different person at work. They might use a different personality or different words, or they might you know, keep some of their you know, more crazy thoughts to themselves. Um, and when they're home, they're, they're, it's hanging all out. And, and, and yet they are surprised when, the, when there's such a difference. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's very true. And I think it's important for people to know that whether it's a guide dog working in its harness or a puppy, working in its coat, that there is off time mm -hmm. when they just get to be a dog. I know, I think there's a misconception about that because some of the people that I come across and you know, will say, oh, she's going off to work and um, you know, she only has a chance to be a puppy now and all. And I try to explain to them that most of the dogs, well, all of the dogs don't work 24 seven, even though it is sort of a 24 seven job. But I mean, they do have downtime and they do get to play and their people appreciate them and give them time to relax and let go. And um, a couple of our dogs have ended up in places where there's another dog in the house, which is even more fun. So, um, and sometimes it's an, a second guide dog. So it's fun for both of them that, you know, they have down, down and release time. Um, but people are, do have the misconception that that dog is in harness and working 24, 24 hours, hours a it day. Is, it is. People get very upset with me. Well, does he ever get to relax? And I'm like, oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think it's also interesting because I think a lot of people think that when he's home with me, he's doing other things like opening doors and, and things that are a different type of service. Mm -hmm. um, so, that's, so that's really um, an interesting thing. And, and am I correct in, in remembering or, or thinking that you have, you take these dogs into all kinds of public places, restaurants, stores, just like I would take my guide mm -hmm. dog. And that, is that a, do you, and I don't know the answer, so I'm sorry I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> is that a law in Connecticut that you have access or is it a, is it a custom based on the employ in the owner manager's kindness? No, it's part of the, the law that guide dogs are allowed everywhere. And so they have, in Connecticut at least, they've extended that to cover guide dogs in training. Okay, that's um, what I thought. <laughs> and I mean, if push came to shove, I suppose that they could say, well, you're not an official trainer. And, you know, I would never question that or push it. I'm, you know, we're taught just, you know, to politely, you know, go off and do something else if someone really doesn't want us to come in. Um, but uh, 
it, it is an extension of the law that allows guide dogs to go everywhere. And that's so fabulous. That's just awesome. So have you ever taken any of your puppies that you're raising on trains or planes or buses? Um, we actually used to have a city bus that used to, um, the driver used to stop and take a break near our house and we'd be out walking the dogs and so he would let us on the bus to oh, so um, cool. have the dog check it out. Um, we do a parade in the fall uh, in Bridgeport and we have to take a school bus from the parking lot up to the parade route. So all of our, all of our labs have gotten to go on the bus um, <laughs> in the fall. That's awesome. And uh, there's a couple of actually, um, they, we just had a big daffodil festival in Meriden and the transportation from the parking lot is also school bus. So that's kind of where they get that. Um, not been on the train not been on a plane because puppies in training are not allowed no, no. in the yep. plane yep. Um, like a guide dog would be which right. I think is I don't know I really wish they would change that because it would be such a great experience and there are so many things that happen around the country that involve puppy raisers and guide dog users yes. that yep. we can't get to unless we can drive, drive. because yep. I wouldn't want to put my dog in the right. cargo hold. Exactly so. yes in fact um, and it's so cool because one of the things that Karen and I get to do together is that we, we are part of a, a puppy raiser guide dog user group. And it's so cool because what happens is so often a guide dog user like me knows my dog was raised by someone but never really meets a puppy raiser. And a puppy raiser does this amazing thing but never really gets to talk to someone who has a guide dog. And so it's, it's two absolutely integral parts of this dog's life and yet the humans that are a part of those two ends of you know, those two pieces of their life so often don't ever get to connect and mm -hmm. communicate. And I just think it's so fabulous that we have this group that we get to do that because I can say to you, you know, or we'll be incidentally, you'll learn that when my dog is, is, is relieving himself, I'm resting my hand on his back. Mm -hmm. And I can learn from you that, you know, so a lot of the things that you do as a puppy raiser are the things that make him so excellent as a guide and it's so it's just such a wonderful connection and it would be so great to be able to expand that out to the things that happen nationally because it is they are wonderful and it would be it would be great to, to do that um we're coming we're getting close to the end and I, I hate it i always want my show to go for at least five hours um but is there anything else i haven't touched on that's really important that i should be have have asked you about um, that you or you want to get out there? Um, I would just say that, you know, for those people who come across a puppy in training or a working dog um, in your travels, that um, a working dog should never be disrupted while it's working. It's, um, it takes away the safety of the partnership. Um, as far as puppies in training go, there are some people who prefer that their dog not be petted. I prefer that mine do be petted because then I think that when they're um, ready to go on to the next step, they'll think they've met everyone in the world already and it doesn't matter to them anymore. And I actually see them turning that off at a certain point. They'll um, you know, say hello to a couple people and then start turning their back like, I'm so done with this. <laughs> so, um, but it's always important to ask um, some, you know, even pet dogs, some dogs are not friendly, some are not good with kids, some are not good with other dogs. So it's always important to ask, and especially with a working team, to not bother them while they're working. I swear I didn't prompt her. Yeah. It's awesome. <laughs> um, can I hold them just for a second? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. So this has been the first installment of per Pup and Person to Partners. And it's a, it's a very exciting series that I'm doing, and it's going to have a bunch of parts with a bunch of different people, and I just am so stoked. Even if you guys, even if you guys are half as stoked as me, it's going to be great. You are watching, as I see it, a blind woman's view. I have Karen with me, who's a puppy raiser. I have Yana with me, who's about to go in for training, and I have Ian, who's a little boy who's just starting his journey. And I thank you so much for watching tonight. Have a fabulous month, and join me next month when I continue my. Pup and person to partners. Thanks so much.